Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School, everyone here and those online. We're so glad you could be a part of this and we could be here with you all um, this morning. We are thankful for a God who understands our needs very well. Glad to see the Diases out of quarantine and here with us. Uh, we've been kind of locked down here on our campus. Uh, we are seeking to have some carefulness. Uh, it's sometimes more apparent than others with social distancing. Uh, but uh, anyway, we are seeking to be uh, careful. But one of the things that came to my mind this, this morning uh, from Romans chapter 13, it says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. You know, when we have things like this pandemic going on, it is a wake-up factor for many to realize, wait a minute, life is not going to always be as we've known it or think that, you know, for years and years it'll be whatever. It reminds us we are in a time that soon will end life as we know it. And thank have a God who is, is here to be our personal Savior, our living Lord, that will uh, see us through the times that we are living in. And I am, I am thankful to have an opportunity to worship uh, together by internet and also here locally. This is our second to last Sabbath that we'll be together for our college. We're, we have one more week of classes, then test week, and and uh, we come to the close of our semester. Uh, but we are thankful that we can be together, worshiping together. I have a few announcements for you before we have prayer. And uh, one is that if you have any prayer or praises, prayer requests or praises that you would like us to mention next service, uh, that you can send those in to prayer at ohc.org, and we will try to get those and then we can share some of our corporate uh, desires and needs. There is plenty to pray about with what's happening with the virus right now. All of us know about that. And it's serious. It's not a, um, a light thing that's happening. And I, I am thankful for a God who understands that, who we can come to with all of those needs. And we'll talk some more about that next service. So if you have those, prayer at ohc.org. And... Um, I'll share a few more announcements before, at the beginning of our next, uh, our next session, our worship service. Uh, but for now, uh, let us just bow our heads for prayer as we uh, come to the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, we bow before you in heart right now, acknowledging our dependence upon you. Lord, when we see things like this pandemic happening, it just reminds us that, that we are not in control of our own future are our own selves, but we can trust you with what is going on right now with our loved ones and friends and others around this planet that are suffering greatly, who have already lost loved ones as a result of this. And Lord, I thank you that you are the same you've ever been. You love us. You mean to do us good. And you are wanting to even bring good out of the tragedies that that sin-filled world living brings us right now. And I just uh, thank you for being the ever-present help in trouble. And we pray for your blessing in our service today and, and uh, that this Sabbath would be a, uh, an uplift to each of us, that we would grow closer to you as a result of focusing our minds in your word and on you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's, it's amazing looking back. Uh, the mission story, the story I'm going to be sharing this morning actually happened in Montgomery when we were last there canvassing. And when I first started to think about what to share for a mission story, I had a hard time. First off, because I don't write down stuff. Second, because there was just so much that happened in that program. Uh, but the one story I'm going to share is that it was... I believe our second to last day in Montgomery, and it had been rainy, dreary, just a regular day pretty much in the spring. <laughs> and 
I had begun to start to think it had been a powerful day already, but it was ending the close of the day. And I was getting tired. I was like, you know, I, I really honestly, you know, thinking ahead, planning, you know, getting back to school, this is what we're going to do. My mind was not focused on meeting people and talking to them. And people weren't responding, and I realized why that they weren't responding. It's because I wasn't engaging with them. They could tell that I was distant when I was speaking with them. And so I stopped and I prayed. I was like, Lord, you know my mind, but there's people out here that need to hear your word. Don't let people die that, would, that because of my neglect, they don't hear. And got up, kept on going. The next house I went to, nobody was home. House after, knocked on the door. This gentleman came out, and he's like, you know, what are you doing? I shared with him, you know, the books. Not interested, uh, but because he gave a reason his wife was in the hospital. And immediately there, I was like, is there anything, can we pray for her? He's like, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So we said a word of prayer, and I was just about to leave. I left him with a happy, uh, Steps to Christ, small version. And he, he looked, started looking through it, and just as I was about to say, well, you have a good day, and God bless, he's like, what church puts this out? I'm like, well, personally, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, but these books are put out by the Blue Bible Story Company. He looked up, and he said, you Seventh-day Adventist? And in my mind, it was not going to end well. It's like, I stayed too long here. Lord, please help me to move on to the next. But that didn't happen. And what he said next floored me. He said, you Seventh-day Adventists are right. Now, for me personally, it's like my mind was like, wait, what? That does not happen. That's not what I'm used to. And he's like, yes, it's on Sabbath day, da 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 He's like, you guys are right. The seventh day is the Sabbath. I'm like, well, yes, sir. I'm, I mean, absolutely, but how, why do you say that? He's like, have you ever heard of a person called Walter Weiss? <laughs> I, I had to take a step back. I'm like, yeah. In fact, I know a friend that was brought into the church by him. And he's like, I've been listening to his series, and he just explains it piece by piece. I used to work with a person that was Seventh-day Adventist. I used to think, man, he's you know, just a strange, odd person. But now I've been listening to Walter Weiss, and you guys, what you say is truth. What you say is truth. And I, I said, you know, have you ever heard of a book called The Great Controversy? He's like, no, I've never heard of that. I said, sir, this will explain everything in written form which you have been hearing with Walter Weiss and which you've been studying through. And he's like, I'll read it. I don't have any money. In fact, he went and grabbed some more because he's like, this is all I have. I'm like, sir, we're not out here for the money. This book will be a blessing to you. And he took it and read it. And what really struck me the most is that God can bring unexpected people if we are patient and wait upon him. If that did not happen, I walked away from that door just like, wow. Once again, God came through. And I didn't know what to say. I was, I was literally stunned. I went to the next door and, I'm, and I stood in front of it for a few minutes like, what just happened? <laughs> What just happened? God provided. But we just need to make sure, and this transfers over into our lives today, we just need to make sure that we're faithful. If I had skipped that door, if I hadn't left him with um, steps to Christ, if I hadn't answered his question honestly, then who knows what might have happened? Who knows what path or wherever... The, the Lord may have, reminds me of the story of Esther, the Lord may have brought salvation in another way to that person and a message to another way. But what about for me personally? The experience of meeting that man. 
And I just pray that, uh, that we will continue to be faithful day by day, not just because I know a lot of us were in school, maybe going home, going elsewhere, that we will transfer lessons that we've learned canvassing into our day-to-day lives because that is the keys to success. Well, we're happy to be with you this morning, um, and this is a tremendous subject we have to discuss, the Bible, uh, the uniqueness of the Bible, and this, the first of our lessons this quarter, which have to do with interpreting the Bible, how to understand the Bible, how to read it the right way. But before we start, why don't we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're very thankful to be here this morning, and we want to invite your presence. We, we have invited your presence, and we know you're here, and and we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to teach us, to guide us in our discussion, that we may learn the things we need to learn, and most of all, be drawn closer to you. So we pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Bible is a very special book. Uh, I think all of us believe that and realize that and, and accept that. Um, it's a book that fully one-third of the population on earth hold as special. Okay, we're talking about uh, two-point-something billion people. Uh, so the first question that I'd like to start out with is, what is so special about the Bible? And uh, just whoever would like to answer that and... We can go around, and, and there's mics for people in the audience. If you have a comment, please feel free to come up to the mic and, and share. Yes. Great question. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is the fact that the Bible, you know, is written later on in the lesson. It brings out how it was written by so many different people, so many different places, you know, with their own ideas and thoughts during that time. But yet there is a consistent theme, and it is a theme of, of lifting up Christ throughout the whole Bible. And I think that just makes it... An amazing thing that, you know, the Bible, even though it was written a bunch of different people, you know, different places, that it can have a consistent theme. And I think that's a beautiful thing, that we can see Jesus in every part of the Bible. Not only that, but thousands of years separated yeah, them. Correct. Yeah. I remember my wife, uh, we're not married yet at that time. She was in her ver- very early Christian walk. And... Um, she was questioning, is the Bible the book? And she found this apologetic Indian doctor on YouTube. It's not the very famous one. Uh, I forget his name. It's another one. And she could never find those videos anymore. But he analyzes every single holy book, the Quran, the Indian uh, writings, and then he gives... Uh, the evidence that the, the people that follow those books give to say that it is holy. And um, it's just all the evidence for those books is so faulty, you know, as being inspired. For example, one of them was us because the, the style of writing is so beautiful, they must be inspired. You know, so I think it was about the Quran, one of the things. And then... Um, and I mean, there are so many deeper reasons why the Bible is an inspired book. But I just wanted to mention that when you compare it to everything else, it's almost like comparing gold with pebbles. Right? Okay. Um, I want to go a little more into this so far. So we've talked about all the different authors. Okay, what about 40-some different authors that are involved in writing the Bible from many different occupations, many different backgrounds, different ages? We talked about the time span, okay, that it took to write the Bible, the 1,500 years approximately. And so we're talking about just, we're talking about generations of this generation next, and we know how generations change from one generation to the other. We talk about the generation gap and things like that. But all these different generations are involved in, in the Bible. And also comparing it to other writings. Is there anything else, though? Have we exhausted 
or the specialness, the uniqueness of the Bible. Is there anything else? Son, I think it is. One of the days spoke about the transforming power of God. I think that is an amazing thing of the Word, that you see people reading the Word and not only just reading it, but then letting it change. Well, that's what happens when you read the Word. It changes your life. And I've seen that when you just see people like maybe they're not interested in the Word at first, but then they get into it, and then you just see their life changing. I think that's another huge thing. You know, when you read a you know, maybe some, some works of art, as it were, in the writing specter um, could change you, maybe in a negative way in other, in other ways, but it's just amazing how transforming the nature of the Word is. I've seen that time and time again, even in my own life. When you, when you read things and you're like, wow, you know, this is something that needs to change in my life, I think that's a beautiful thing, and it shows the power of the, of the Word. I think uh, something that gives the Bible a lot of, um, of weight is, uh, is also his historical accuracy. Um, over and over again, Skepticus says, oh, well, there's no Hittite nation that never existed. We never seen any evidence, you know, and so since, therefore, since there's no evidence, there was no, the Bible's incorrect, you know. How can this big nation that was from however big it was, and the Bible says it exists, and we find nothing on it, then the Bible must be false. But then later on in history, we find that there was a Hittite nation, and they proved it. And so over and over again, skeptics have always tried to disprove the Bible by saying, like, well, this one didn't exist or this didn't exist. But then over and over again, we find in the, in the records or in just archaeology, uh, we find proof of the Bible. Uh, not only that, um, out of every ancient manuscript or ancient book, the Bible has the most manuscripts. I think it's in the thousands. And some other ones are only like hundreds or, or in the single, uh, or they're double digits. Yeah, it, uh, the lesson says it doesn't. 34,600? 24,000. 24,000? Oh, wow. 24,000. More than I thought. I thought <laughs> 24,600. So, yeah, it's just amazing. Um, so, what we've heard is another thing that makes the Bible special is its effect on people. Okay, it transforms lives. Uh, and one thing on that, I was just thinking as he was speaking, um, not only does it change the life and the things you do, but it changes the heart. I think that's the more important thing because sometimes I was thinking maybe some other people would argue that their religious books might, to some extent, give them a plan of how to live a better way to some extent. But this, the word changes your heart. That's, that's, I, I think that's the thing that sets it apart. Because some would argue, oh, if you read, you know, these certain things, it'll make you a better person or whatever. But, you know, whatever the actions may be, the heart could still be wicked. So I think the word changes the heart. I think that's the amazing thing. Okay, that's a real good point. Um, also, it was mentioned about the historical accuracy and the documentation, uh, documentation for the New Testament especially. Uh, other books like Plato and Homer, uh, they only have like maybe eight manuscripts or maybe uh, 50 or 100 manuscripts where there's all these thousands with the New Testament. And Plato and Homer, the first copies we have of them are like 800 years after they were written. And the Bible, we have the manuscripts from within 100 to 200 years. So that lends more weight to the evidence. And this kind of takes us to our next question. Uh, sir, go ahead. Um, something that I think makes the Bible really special too is in Daniel chapter 2 in verse 27 it says Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men the astrologers the magicians the soothsayers show unto the king but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days and so it's through prophecy that we, we understand, like for those that don't trust the Bible, don't know if they can trust the accuracy of the Bible, it's through prophecy, knowing that the Bible tells us what's going to happen before it happens, that we can know that everything else in this thing is accurate. And even more so on a, on a personal level, um, in the Bible it also says that the, the Word of God is a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And in the Bible you can find every experience that a human can go through. You can read a part of the Bible and find that God understands exactly what's going through your mind right now. 
And no matter what the experience is, there's always some counsel, something to take you through it. And I feel like that's one thing that makes the Bible different from any other book, is that you know you're coming in contact with the mind of God because he doesn't just know the future, but he knows you. He knows your life and he knows your future and how to guide you through it. That's right. Thank you. Uh, yes, the Bible takes us to every experience. I, I mean, when you look at everything in the Bible, uh, you cannot compare it to another book. You know, the way we decide whether a history book is factual, we compare it to other history books. And we see if they, they're having the same description of the same event or on the same date. But the Bible, with everything that has just been mentioned this morning, there's no other book on this planet that covers all that. And so it's definitely a unique book, and it cannot be compared to another book. Steve, did you have something? Yes, I, I think... The, how, what history, has, as what he mentioned also, has just proven over and over again that the Bible knows what's going to happen. Like how we will try and join Europe, and many men tried to join Europe after the, the fall of the Roman Empire, and they got so close, and they were so powerful, and they were so, they were just like, why didn't they do it? You know, and, and some, some freak accident, they said freak accident, you know, made them not be able to accomplish their goal. And it's just, it goes... It just gives more credit to the Bible. The Bible says that Europe will never, there will never again be a unified Europe. And even now they're trying to unify Europe through the EU and stuff, but they're still extremely divided. So it, it just gives even more credence. <laughs> yeah. yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. We go to a bookstore, they do still exist, a few of them, <laughs> and you find different categories, history, self-help, uh, child rearing, you find all these different categories. The Bible has something on everything. If you had categories, the Bible would have to appear in all of these categories. I can't think of another book that is so comprehensive. They have something that would meet every single category. It's an all-encompassing. Amen. Yes. And just to add on to what Chris was saying, not only does it cover something that meets everyone exactly where they are at their life, but we can read the same set, a combination of words and letters, and everyone can get something so drastically different. Hmm. I remember I was sharing a Bible verse with my mom. I, we do this all the time. And I'll share my point of view, and then she was like, wow, that also reminds me of da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, oh, I would have never, ever thought of that. And so it's just so cool that with no other piece of literature can that be, like, you can exhaust it. And then you're like, okay, well, that's it. But with the Bible, we have libraries on the Bible. And so that's one of the, the only books where it can do that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's something in the Bible that appeals to the vastest, if that's a word, majority of people in the world. I and mean, we can see by its popularity, it's the best-selling book uh, for the last 2,000, more than 2,000 years that it's existed. Uh, it's, it's the first printed book, the first translated book, uh, and the majority of the world, the majority of the religions of the world seek the Bible. So it speaks to more people than any other book in the world. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So the, the, we kind of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Quick thing, yeah. I'm going to comment in a minute. But um, just one thing I was thinking about, as she was mentioning, it's almost like the Bible, you know, when you read a storybook, there's not like many lessons, you, or, or maybe there's many lessons, but like for one sentence, normally, like she said, you're going to pick out whatever the author said, but that's the Bible, it's almost like 5D or something. Like there's so many different mm. angles you can look mm. at. There's so many different like ways you can see it. I think that was a really good point that was brought up. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you, you what I think, how I think the Bible's so amazing is the, it's just um, so many different authors from different timelines, different occupations, kings, fishermen, um, scribes, poor people, carpenters, just so many different authors. And it's one continuous thought. You know, when Jesus was telling uh, the Pharisees, uh, search the scriptures in them, you think you have eternal life, but they, but the, but they are which testify of me. And so it's just one continuous thought talking about Jesus Christ from different timelines, from different places. Like Daniel and Revelation, they never met. I mean, John and Daniel, they never met, but yet they wrote about the same stuff. And it just broadens the mind. So I just love that about the Bible. So many different writers, but talking about the same person. So. Amen. 
Great. Well, this brings us to our next question, which actually has already been touched on, but maybe there's some more thoughts about it. And that is, how do we know the, uh, let's see, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. How do we know that the Bible is true? Like I said, we've touched on this, but I just want to open it up to see if there are any other thoughts on how do we know that the Bible is true? Um, the Bible is an interesting book because it doesn't just show the best side of humanity. Mm. It doesn't show all the good and good feeling things that happen in history. It, it says it as it happened. And, and sometimes we get confused because we see all these bad things that happen in the Bible. And it's like, well, this was like a leader. Should we be like him? And it's like, well, no, the answer is no. We should not be like every leader that's in the Bible. And just the honesty and the raw honesty of the Bible is something that I believe gives it credit. For instance, uh, in the Bible, uh, it, at the time, a woman's... Um, like if she saw something, like a, a witness, if she was a witness to something, her witness wouldn't be taken as strongly as a man's witness. And so some of the first people that saw Christ's resurrection were women. Now, if it hurt their story, why would they say that women saw Jesus rise first? Why would they say that? Well, because that's how it happened. You know, so it's just, I love it how the Bible is just honest about everything. Amen. Kind of going back to what uh, Nathan was saying a little while ago, uh, that text you read, sanctify them through your truth, your word is truth. Sanctification, what is that? That's just not something we can do ourselves. That's something the power of God does. In all these other religions we we're talking about today, you got to work at it. I remember my old coal porter leader from years ago told me um, every other false religion is based on works, except Christianity. Christianity, the Bible, is the only religion by which you surrender to God, he does the rest. He'll give you the power, he'll change your heart, he'll change your mind. He'll give you the ability to live by his standards. You don't have to force yourself. He'll change your heart and mind. He'll write his law on your heart to make it part of your nature. There's no other book that does that. I wanted to say that there's a story of one of to be disciples sitting underneath the tree, right? And um, the, the disciple comes and, and tells him, come see Jesus from Nazareth. And he said, is there anything good that can come out of Nazareth? And then um, the disciple says, come and see. You know, and a person may say, is there anything good? I'm the, it's just a book. There is, if you compare to the other books, there is nothing to it. It was written by people from, from different walks of life. But I think the main evidence for the, for the case of the Bible is uh, empirical evidence. You know, the change they makes on you. And that's... Well, in White says that that's our most powerful uh, testimony is our own testimony, all right? And I think that's where the power of the Bible can be really exemplified is throughout, through our own testimony of the power that has wrought in us. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yes? Um, also, I think someone did touch on this, but prophecy for sure is one of the sure signs of the validity of the Bible. We can see um, the city of Tyre, even to this day, no one has inhabited it. So mm -hmm. prophecies is something that God has given us to show that the Bible has truth because it says what it says it would do, basically. That's right, thank you. Amen. I think uh, I wanna touch on, and I'll let Mabushi go. Uh, I wanna touch on something that a lot of skeptics um, have problems with the Bible. And that's where they, they call, they say that the Bible has many inaccuracies. We have uh, four different Gospels, and uh, in some of the Gospels you'll have uh, one demoniac, and the other one you'll have two demoniacs. And, and now, the, at, at, at surface level, you look at it and you'd be like, oh yeah, that's a problem, you know? But at the same time, if you really look a little deeper, it is not a problem at all. Um, any officer will tell you if everyone that saw the same thing happened told you the exact same thing, 
will tell you that there's some kind of conspiracy going on here. Because it, it, sometimes even to the point where, yeah, there's two people, they thought there were two, there, maybe there were three, you know? It's just like, even though they all saw the same thing, sometimes their stories are wildly different. But in, there's one thing that's always the same. The overarching theme of what happened is always consistent. So the Bible, in, even though there's four different Gospels, the overarching theme is always the same. It's not different. The little details, you know, one, two people, it doesn't change the story. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, just like the, um, the question, you know, how do we know the Bible is truth? Um, it, it, when you look at what's taking place in the world, let's say someone who doesn't have a Bible, someone who's never looked at the Bible whatsoever, they can observe that, you know, when you go through this type of circumstance in life, this takes place. You know, when you go through and you look at nature, this happens. When you go and you, you have a certain experience with, with things that take place in life that everyone can agree with, it's like, wow, you know, that actually makes sense. And, you know, the Bible, it, it corresponds with what we experience in reality. It's like it makes a statement and then it's kind of like now test to see if this statement is true. And I remember when I was working at Walmart one time and I came across the, the, the verse in Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends are over the ways of death. And I was thinking about that verse as I was at work. I was like, wow. So, God, you're telling me that the natural way of every single man is going to lead to death. And I started kind of testing it out and I was like, okay, I know a natural thing for me was to kind of like to go to the movies. And I started playing it out like, okay, well, I used to love most popular movies or comedy movies and action movies and inappropriate movies, you know? And like when you look at the, the effects that that has on the human mind and the type of people that produces and the effects of those people and their actions, eventually it leads to emotional and even physical death. And it's like when you can test out the verses to see, you know what, God puts himself out there and he says, okay, now try this verse out and see if this is actually true. And then you live it out in life and it's like, wow, like this actually makes sense. So the Bible, it's God puts himself out there as the author of the Bible and he says, you know what? I'm going to give them an opportunity to taste to see if this is actually true. And if it's not true, then hey, but it's, it's going to come out as true when you just test it out for yourself, like Mr. Um, Martins was saying. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to start going to, I guess it'll be maybe the next topic about the criticism of the Bible on what Steve has been saying. Um, so I would like to read some Ellen White quotes, but before that, um, you know, sometimes I've, I've, I mentioned this in the music in the church class, and I've heard a very influential, uh, a very influential person saying that the Bible does not say anything about music. Right, in a sense, in a very direct sense, like, oh, what chord to use and things like that. But, um, you know, sometimes we deceive ourselves. And as I was being getting the garden ready, this object lesson from the garden came to me. And I thought, you know, anything in life is the most, the more effort you put in, the more results you get out of it. If I just leave the garden as is, and I don't weed, I don't water, I don't plow, I'm going to only get very small results. If I work diligently at it, I'll get much larger results. And it's the same thing with the Bible. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the field. You have to find a hidden treasure. So the, the more diligent we are, and trying to find what the Bible is talking about this, we'll find, because the Bible may not have direct um, counsel or something, but it will have the, uh, the, the principle that underlies everything, right? And so this is from First Selected Messages. <clears throat> human reasoning and the imaginings of the human hearts are undermining the inspiration of the Word of God, and that which should be received as granted is surrounded by a cloud of mysticism. Nothing stands out in clear and distinct lines upon rock bottom. This is one of the marked signs of the last days. They begin, they begin to question some parts of Revelation and pick flaws in the apparent inconsistencies of this statement and that statement. Beginning at Genesis, they give up that which they deem questionable and their minds lead on. For Satan will lead to any length they may follow in their criticism, 
and they see something to doubt in the whole scriptures. Their faculties of criticism become sharpened by exercise, and I guess it could be the other way around too, right? And they can rest on nothing with a certainty. There is, nowadays there is no truth, right? Everything is relative. You try to reason with these men, but your time is lost. It's like casting pearls to the pigs. They will exercise their power to ridicule even upon the Bible. They even become mockers and they would be astonished if you put it to them in their, in their light. Brethren, cling to your Bible as he reads and stop your criticism in regard to its validity and obey the words and not one of you will be lost. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, I hope everybody would... Oh, there's an... As the, towards the, quest, the question, um, how do we know the Bible is true? Um, obviously, there is a lot of comment that has gone toward it, a little more on it. Um, I mean, Bible is so open, like in certain sense. We know archaeology has proven as, like, more than we need. But, uh, for example, when you think about the book of Dan Daniel opening up uh, with, uh, in that certain year, the third year of reign of King Jehoiakim, he lived in a certain place, he ruled in a certain place. These are all things we can go to the library and just check it and it's right there, it proves itself. And we see the siege happens, these things happen. So the Bible is not like so uh, um, secretive in its information that you cannot use anything to parallel with to say, did it really happen or how did it happen? God is very open. So another, another issue that rises a lot is people think why God has to choose uh, weak human beings to write these things. So recently the Lord led me to the question, why a Bible, you know? So then in my mind, he started to put these thoughts and really explain it to me. I was like, praise the Lord. It, it, it's, it's an act of love. Imagine a father, when we think about Genesis, a father comes home trying to communicate with his children and everybody is hiding because they're afraid of him. Communication is completely broken. Exodus 20, no, don't speak to us. Let Moses speak to us. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel hears a voice from heaven. The other people around him disappear. Jesus being baptized. Some people hear the voice of God. Others hear thunder. It's like such a confusion. So God lowers himself and finds himself a translator. It's like he's so eager to speak to his children that he is willing to do whatever it may take. And I see this in my mom. Whenever he's trying to reason with my brother and they're, they're not reasoning in the same level, she looked at me and she said, talk to your brother. <laughs> it's like, you guys can identify in the same level, you know. I'm trying to speak with him. He's not understanding. And that's, I, in, in some sense, that's, that's what I see God doing through the Bible. You know, he's not able to reason directly anymore because of sin. So he chooses people that can identify with us. And then he's able to still communicate with us. So I see love in this. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's been so many. I hope everybody was taking notes writing this down because all these reasons about why the Bible is true how many of us have run into people that have challenged that you know and here we have so many wonderful reasons thank you yes I have a quick uh, <laughs> thought I was I'm taking a correspondence class right now and one thing that was brought out this week um, as I was reading through was the fact I'd heard it before but it was a reminder um, come well it's a few different places but this one specifically specifically comes from the Great Controversy 526.2. It says, while God has ample evidence for faith, he will never, never remove all excuse for unbelief. All who look for hooks to hang their doubts upon will find them. And those, will refu sorry, and those will ref who refuse to accept and obey God's word until every objection has been removed and there is no longer an opportunity to doubt, will never come to the light. Yes. So it's just an interesting thought that although the Bible, I mean, there's so, everything's pointing to its validity and truth, there might be some doubt that one of you is thinking or somebody that's watching is thinking and, and just being like, well, I haven't heard the answer to that, so I, I can't believe in the Bible. But I believe there is a, a part of faith, you know, in, in these things that we're supposed to say, well, it says it's God's word, and there's so many things pointing, but I, I might not understand that right now. But I, I can trust the Lord with that. I can trust the Lord with that. I, I've, I've heard it said to have a question box, as it were, in our minds that we can have. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't search for those answers, but I'm saying some things that maybe we just haven't found. But uh, have a question box, as it were, and say, well, God, you'll answer those for me in heaven. 
Amen. And uh, so, yeah, that's just an interesting thought there. Yes, thank you. I want to just say, is, is, is there even such thing as faith without doubt? Because Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. So there's an element of hope there. The evidence of things not seen. So if I already know you, and someone comes and tells me, Oh, yeah, Dr. Carlos, he, you know, he wears glasses. He, you know, he, today he's wearing a black suit and dark, a black shoes and a red tie. Said, okay, yeah, I saw him. I know this. There's no, there's no faith there. Mm. Mm. Now, if I had never seen you and I had not seen you today, and a person can, okay, Dr. Collins, it looks like this and this and this and this. Now I have to exercise faith on what the person has told me, mm. right? Mm. And if there's no room to doubt, mm. there's no room for you to have faith. Mm. Right? Okay, that's a very good point. Um, wow, lots of uh, things to consider and keep in mind, and yes. <laughs> yeah, based on what Nathan was saying, we should have an intelligent faith, and God has given us tons of evidence, but if we allow one little doubt or one little misunderstanding to outweigh tons of evidence, then that's not an intelligent faith. In fact, that's ill-reasonable. That's not... That's not logically thinking through what it means to have faith. So, yeah. There are many people who have honest questions, but it seems like many people, there's something else going on. When they're questioning the Bible, it's not questioning the Bible. There's something else going on. And so maybe at times like that, we need to pray and ask God to show us how we can reach those people. I think something else that's really particular about the Bible and this differentiates the Bible from any other book is what it tells us about the God that we serve. In Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23, it says, Can the Ethiopian change his, spot, his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. And every other false religion in the world, you find that they're working to appease God. They, they depend on the force of their own will to change themselves, on meditation and doing the right things. But the Bible says that you can't change yourself. And it's the only book that says that. And it's the only one that says that it's God that helps us to change. Like in Isaiah chapter 1, it says, Although your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. And it's also only our God that proposes to forgive us. It's not because of what we do that we gain forgiveness. But every other false religion in the world, you have to do something in order for the God to like you. But our God, he gave something, even though we didn't deserve it. And he proposes to change us. And I think that's something that makes the Bible special and different than anything else. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, this morning, actually, I was listening to a, a Christian apologist, and he was taking questions from a, an audience, and some very pointed, very strong questions. And this one person just uh, kept, you know, hammering him on, on the certain topics. And, and then he, he asked a very poignant question. And he asked, if Christianity were true and there is a God, and just verifiably you, you're proven that it's true, would you, become, would you be a Christian? And he said, no. So all these things that we say, all this proof that we have, uh, it ultimately for some people is, is not enough because their view of God is just... Well, in my, in my opinion, it's wrong, completely wrong. And unfortunately, whatever Christianity they were shown wasn't Christianity. Yes. And, and a real important thing about that is the fact of these lessons this quarter, how to interpret the Bible. Many people interpret it in a way that does not reveal who God really is. And so our, our prayer is this quarter, we will learn how to interpret the Bible and see God for what he really is. Nathan, you had a... Going off of the whole idea of, well, the idea that we were talking about, how some people may doubt or whatever, for many, well, I shouldn't say many, but some of those, the reason why they doubt is because something is written in that book that they don't like or don't agree with, and sometimes it boils down, <coughs> not, not every instance, I'm not, I'm not trying to throw a blanket over everything, but in some cases it, it's, it's the love of self, that is destroying their want of maybe following this book. So that's, that's one thing. I know there are honest questions as well, but I didn't want to mention that. And also, as, as Steve was saying, you know, I think it is 
there are some that out there that said, well, if God was real, I still, want, I still wouldn't want to believe in him, or what, whatever their thought may be on that. Um, and I think that stems from the issue, if you, I was reading, well, my dad was reading in um, Scriptures Are Safeguard, and we were talking about some in worship this morning, and it was speaking about three different things, why people, if you come into a knowledge of the Bible or, or trying to read the Bible with these, with not understanding these three things correctly, you will find issues. And one of them was the character of God. You know, if you're trying to believe in a God and you, you don't know his actual character, you're going to run into some major issues. If you believe that he's not an all-loving, caring God, you know, it's going to be an issue. Another thing is his government, how he works. So his character, his government, and then uh, thirdly was his purposes. And so when people's uh, understanding of God's character, government, and purposes are messed up, it's going to be very hard for them to understand in a God and even want to believe in a God. That's right. Um, go ahead. Uh, he first. Okay. Yeah. It is amazing to me, with all the scientific evidence we keep coming up with, DNA and all that kind of thing, that people can still believe in evolution. You know, the evidence just keep piling up. Uh, that it's just a bad hypothesis. It should have been discarded years ago. So why isn't it? The, the Apostle Peter uh, reveals this in his second epistle, chapter 3. It first of all says, um, the last day scoffers will come, mocking in the truth and following their own desires. And because they're following their own desires, verse 4 says, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago and, and brought the flood, etc. You know, the word deliberate is in the New Living, New Living Translation, by the way. This is a deliberate act on their part. A deliberate decision on their part because of their own desires, revealed in verse 3. So it's not for lack of empirical evidence. It's like uh, two people seeing a, a, a play, a, a touchdown play that was close on a football game. And one person on one side says, yeah, touchdown, the other says, no good. Why are they doing that? <laughs> they saw the same thing I talked about earlier, you know. It's their desires, what they want to see the result of. Yes. Yeah, I want to speak a little bit to what both uh, our Brother Steve and Brother Nathan mentioned. Um, you know, some people, they can be won by arguments. Other people, they can't be won by arguments. You know, for myself personally, I used to always get into debates with atheists, and I would show them scientifically, historically, archaeologically, biblically, why, you know, the idea of God is not false. And myself personally, I've always been a truth seeker, and I went from believing in God to becoming an atheist because I, that's what I thought where the evidence went. But when I saw the evidence was towards, towards the Bible and God, it took a while, but that was enough for me. Some people, like what Nathan mentioned, no matter how much evidence you give them, it's not enough. But even with that, there's something that's even more powerful that can still reach their hearts, and that's just the lives that we live and the love of Christ, yes, because I, I remember just personally, I've, I've talked to many atheists one-on-one, -on -one, had many examples of, I remember I had like a five and a half hour conversation with an atheist. He spoke five hours, I spoke for 30 minutes, and I was like, if every one of your questions was answered completely, you know, what would that mean for you? And he was like, well, if, if they were all answered and if Jesus Christ appeared, I might believe. And that just told me, Arguments is not enough for a lot of people. I remember a sister at my church, her husband um, is an atheist, and myself and another, another brother, we went, we're having, you know, discussions about the Bible, and I asked that same question with him, and, you know, he admitted, you know what, I don't, I don't want to believe in God. I don't want to believe in Jesus Christ, but we've had three different times where we would speak with him, and he would purposely try to, you know, you know, get a rise out of us and say very blasphemous things, but we would still show Christ-like character. And his wife came up to me and was like, you know, I like these brothers. You know, one day they might become an atheist. But then the wife was responding like, you know what? No, no, maybe you might become a Christian. And he was like, you know what? Maybe. And so that just tells me sometimes when we try to reach people intellectually, with arguments, it may work with some people, but a lot of times it won't work. But when we show Christ-like love to others, it can penetrate something deeper in the person's life and in their heart. And that insight comes from the Bible, Amen. right? That's what it teaches us. That's where, where it makes us. Yes. In the same way, sometimes a lack of Christ-like character 
leads people away from the truth. Yes. yes, that's right. It works both ways. I want to end with one question. We, we only have about five minutes left. Um, on a more practical side, in a sense. And, and the question is, how, uh, from, from the panel and from people out here in the, in the audience, in the congregation, how do we personally deal with all the distractions around us and how do we maintain a living relationship with Christ through his word? Uh, put another way, how do we make time for Bible study or Bible reading, uh, spending that time with the word so the word can do its work with us? How do we find that? How do we do that practically in our own lives? Do you mind if I just say one quick thing of the last comment? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I was just thinking of doubting, doubting Thomas and others that doubted in Scripture. I was trying to think of what, what was done for them to the point where they were able to believe. And many of the experiences I think of, they were brought to Jesus. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the important thing when we're dealing with people that are doubting and all. First of all, we need to have our connection with Christ, which we'll be getting to. Um, but pointing them to Jesus. You know, the Scriptures say that as Christ is lifted up, He draws all men. So I think the point is to seek to point, be, be loving to them if they may not understand or believe the way we do. That doesn't, that doesn't cut our love. That, that should make us love them more. And so I think that's one way of dealing with that. Um, going to the other, well, I'll let somebody else. Well, I was just going to mention what, you, what you're saying. This one gone too. No, I think it is. It's working. Um, it, it's, it's never about winning the argument. Don't try and win the argument because you're just going to lose people. You know, it's showing Christ. It's all about, ultimately, everything always comes back to a relationship with Christ. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. Uh, even if you win the argument, you still, you lost everything. Okay. All right, so then to, that qu to the question, how do we do that? How do we spend that time with the Word in our practical lives, in our schedules? I think the first thing is, uh, I was talking, this got brought to me, uh, I was searching for some... Uh, samples on YouTube of music for the music in the church class, like, you know, brief music history. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys have seen these um, ads for this Masterclass website called masterclass.com, that they have very well-renowned people in their field doing video lectures, you know, so for example, for violin, they have uh, Itzhak Perlman and uh, Hans Zimmer for, co for composing film music. And anyways, they had this lady. She's a bestseller of short stories. She's a writer. And she says that everybody's a good writer, but you know what kills your writing skills? Interruption. Hmm. And she says, you know what kills your, your um, imagination? Being interrupted. And I remember my wife read this article once because her family has uh, both her grandparents, except her grandpa, uh, he's 95. They all die of Alzheimer. And she was doing some research about that and um, she got into know what is beneficial or, or not good for the brain. And then she saw this uh, research on distraction. When you're trying to do something, and you got distracted by your phone buzzing or your smartwatch sending you a notification. And that is just so detrimental to the brain, extremely bad. And um, so I think the first thing we need to, you know, go to our closet, okay. right? like, like Jesus says, you know, and put on, do not disturb. And because some, some people, you know, um, we are, nowadays we are addicted to screens. And if you're that addicted, you know, Dwayne Lemon says, well, make your smartphone work for you then. You know, put on, do not disturb. And there are so many good apps for Bible study. If you really want to be on your smartphone, you can use that for good. But I think the main thing is distraction. And there was one time I heard this guy, he's a Marine. And he said, I got up at 4 a.m. every day. You know why? Because everybody else is sleeping. So nobody else is going to text me or call me so I can actually do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. right? So distraction is pretty bad for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Indeed, yes. I, and, and the thing about it is I, I do believe that the most important thing is our connection with Christ, as was mentioned. And you know what? The devil knows that too. So he's going to do whatever it takes to try to sever that connection. 
whatever means he is, even good, even as it were good things, you know, things that aren't wrong, but things that need to be done, but he can just get us distracted, like uh, uh, Mr. Martin was saying. But uh, one thing that I've done is I try not, and this doesn't always happen, sometimes I might need it on for something, but I leave my phone off, or at least on airplane mode, until I'm done with my devotions. And that has proved helpful, because as soon as you turn on your phone, I turn my phone off at night, and as soon as you turn it on, it'll be like, you know, going off or whatever, emails or whatever else may be coming in. And that can be a big distraction. It can get your mind off from your time with the Lord to time on whatever your phone, and not wrong things, but just things that are taking your time from the Lord. So yeah, I think that's one practical thing we can do is, and I'm not saying everybody has to do this, but it's, it's helpful. Leave your phone off. You know, you don't need it on. We, people can get a hold of us in, in an hour, an hour and a half, or how long our devotions are. They don't need us at that moment. And um, another thing is scheduling a time to do so. If, if you don't schedule a time to do so, the, the devil's going to make everything get busy, and you're going to be like, oh, my. And I and literally set a time. I, Lord, in, I, what I do in mine is I actually have a time for prayer and a time for study and so on and so forth, journaling throughout my devotions. Now, I'm not saying... I'm being honest, I'm working on, on like consistently doing that, that specific time, meaning like when I have prayer time there, and I have other prayer time throughout the day, but I'm just saying like scheduling it out helps, otherwise the time can just fly by and you're like, man, did I really, you know, am I, did I connect as much as I could have in this time? So I think scheduling and, and like you said, getting away from distractions, even putting your phone in the other room. I hear that for <coughs> students, that putting your phone in another room while you're studying is actually very helpful for your mind um, not getting distracted. So that's just another plug for that, but that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do any of us have a problem finding time to eat? Hmm. Or to take a shower? Or to teach our children? Uh, it's a matter of priorities. Uh, there's a text in Sunday lesson, I think, that speaks to this a little bit, where Moses says about the law of God in the words of this book, for the, it is not a futile thing for you because it is your life. And by this word, you shall prolong your days in the land. Do we believe that? Do you believe your very life depends on your time with God? If you come to that conclusion, you'll make time, won't you? Thank you. Our time is up. I want to thank the members of the panel uh, for your contributions and also for the congregation, for your contributions. I just want to add one final thing. Many good points brought up this morning. I want to leave you with one other practical thought about having this time with God, about spending your time in the Word, and that is um, it's going to change. You're in school now, and there's a certain way you'll do it, and you'll have that time in the Word. When you graduate, things change. And you got to figure out a different way to do it. And then, depending on your life goals, you may change jobs. And there again, your schedule changes. You have kids. <laughs> and everything changes. And so it's kind of like I heard this guy teaching this other guy how to box. And they talk about how you got to weave and bob. Some of you know what I'm talking about there. You kind of have to do that with life. Okay? you got to be flexible. But primarily is how much do you want it? And we want to pray that God create that hunger and thirst in us for his word. Let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your word. We're grateful that you speak to us, that you meet with us, that you, that you want to be with us. In spite of sin, you have thought of ways to, to dwell with us and to communicate with us. We pray, Father, that you will continue to guide each person here as we seek that that fellowship with you and that you will continue with us as we go into the divine service this morning. We pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us here at Watch Hills Academy and College for our weekend program. We sincerely hope you've been blessed. To keep sharing the good news, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the notification bell before you go. Also, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Have a blessed Sabbath.